morning. morning. Welcome to our second of three midweek Advent services. We continue with the theme, Prepare Ye, a classic call of the Advent season to be prepared for the coming of Christ. And today that will involve prayer as Brother Carl delivers the message to us. So we'll worship with the order of service that we have in hand or on screen, beginning with the introduction. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. As two candles are enkindled and give light to the darkness, so enkindle our hearts by your light. And the response of reading, your loyal love, Lord, extends to the skies. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strongest mountains. Your justice is like the deepest sea. Your faithful love is priceless, God. They feast on the bounty of your house. You let them drink from your river of pure joy. Within you is the spring of life. In your light we see light. Now let us make a joyful noise to the Lord to sing some of the hymns of the season in the big hymnal starting at 331. Ed, you have one picked out for us? 349. 349. Hark the glad sound. Good place to start. Let's sing number the stanza one and two, two verses of three forty nine. Forty-three. Prepare the royal highway. Let's do one and four. One and four of hymn number three forty-three. Francis, 
3.44. Let's, uh, let's do one, two, and three. Three stanzas of hymn 3.44. Twyla. 338. 338. It is two verses. Let's sing both verses. 338. Let's let Joan have our concluding hymn here. To the Blue Book, number 630. Today we'd light two candles, so we will sing the first two stanzas of 630.
Our Old Testament reading today from the prophet Isaiah chapter 42. But here is my servant, the one I uphold, my chosen who brings me delight. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout aloud or make his voice heard in public. He will not break a bruised reed. He will not extinguish a faint wick, but he will surely bring justice. He will not be extinguished or broken until he has established justice in the land. The coastlands await his teaching. God the Lord says, the one who created the heavens, the one who stretched them out, the one who spread out the earth and its offspring, the one who gave breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you for a good reason. I will grasp your hand and guard you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nation. The epistle reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his powerful strength. Put on God's armor so that you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. We are not fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day and after you have done everything possible to still stand. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist, justice as your breastplate, and put shoes on your feet so that you are ready to spread the good news of peace. Above all, Carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Offer prayers and petitions in the Spirit all the time. Stay alert by hanging in there and praying for all believers. We stand and speak the verse. Hallelujah, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. All humanity will seek God's salvation. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous before God, blameless in their observance of all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant and they both were very old. One day, Zechariah was serving as a priest before God because his priestly division was on duty. Following the customs of priestly service, he was chosen by lottery to go into the Lord's sanctuary and burn incense. All the people who gathered to worship were praying outside during this hour of incense offering. An angel from the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and overcome with fear. The angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to your son, and you must name him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many people will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the Lord's eyes. He must not drink wine and liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He will bring many Israelites back to the Lord their God, He will go forth before the Lord, equipped with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children. He will turn the disobedient to righteous patterns of thinking. He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. 
I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news to you. Know this, what I have spoken will come true at the proper time. But because you did not believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered why he was in the sanctuary for such a long time. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he gestured to them and could not speak. When he completed the days of his priestly service, he returned home. Afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. She kept to herself for five months, saying, This is the Lord's doing. He has shown his favor to me by removing my disgrace among other people. Here ends the gospel. You may be seated and we'll sing the hymn.
and the 400 years of silence has ended. So can you imagine that shocking news on Zechariah? Hey, you're going to have a child. Zechariah was at least 60 years old because in the scripture it says we are old and we cannot have children. And at that time, 60 years was the kind of the cutoff of when women could have children. Now, I would imagine, though, that they were much older than that. I can imagine that there were many, many, many prayers on both Zechariah and Elizabeth asking God for a child. Because back in those days, if a woman could not have a child, she was considered a traitor. That was the wife's role, was to bear her, children, her husband's children. But that silence came to an end from God, and Zechariah received that news that he would have a baby. I can only imagine the hearts of the people for 400 years not hearing from God. Although I'm sure there were millions of prayers being lifted up, is it much different than today? How many prayers do we have that are lifted up that seemingly are unanswered? I can imagine that we all can recount several that feel like God did not answer. So why bother? Why do we pray? What good is it if he does not answer? Well, first we have to understand, first off, what is prayer? What is it? Here's a really good definition I found. That prayer is a personal communication with God, a conversation from our heart to His. Prayer is how we express our adoration, our thanks, and our request to Him. Simply put, it is a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with our God. Very simple. Let me ask you this. If I was to ask you to get up here and say a prayer, what emotions would go through your heart? Fear? Would you tremble? I would definitely be able to uh, relate to you. Because asking me to pray in public has always drawn fear. And we're not supposed to succumb to fear, are we? So how should we pray? Is there a right way or a wrong way? It's pretty funny. Before I became Lutheran, I went to several different churches, I guess, so I'm not Lutheran. But we all have one thing in common. When asked to pray, what position do we take? Hold your hand, bow your head, close your eyes. Doesn't matter if you're standing or sitting, that's your position. But where does that come from? I've searched through the Bible, I've looked at Luther's Catechism. And I've asked Concordia professors, where does it tell me that that is supposed to be my prayer position? I haven't found it. And nobody has been able to tell me. So I did some research. And that position actually has been adopted from old days when you would go to the presence of a king. Right? You had to keep your hands down, clasped in front of you, so that the king's guard would know that you had no weapon in your hand. And it would be easy to tell if somebody's getting ready to strike the king because the first thing they would have to do is move their hand. You would keep your head down because it was dishonoring and disrespectful to the king to walk in staring him in the face. So to show your honor and respect, you would bow your head. And we kind of adopted the close your eyes thing because for me, I'm a little ADD. And if I keep my eyes open there in prayer, am I really paying attention to what's being said? So I close my eyes to help me focus and not get distracted. And that's our physical position. But there's other physical positions that we read through our scripture that tell us how other people pray. Moses and Abraham. Several times you see in scripture who they pray. They walked outside and they just put their hands up. 
Now, if we had another church, I'm going to get some crap. And uh, what about Elijah? Elijah laid on the ground in the temple on a sackcloth, just laid there, spread out before the Lord. King David, the same thing. And what about Jesus? How did he pray? In his prayer in the garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested, he was laying face down on the ground in absolute, full surrender. Now, what would that look like, church? If we all got up here and lay on the ground, pray to God. Some of us might not be able to get back up. Right? But is it the physical posture that is important when you pray? No. It's your heart. Where is your heart? Remember the description of prayer. It's like heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God. Where is your heart when you pray? First, uh, Second Chronicles says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their prayer, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Are we humble when we pray? I guarantee you that most of us know the Lord's Prayer by heart. But do we really know what it absolutely means? Are we humbling ourselves when we're praying that prayer? Or all these other prayers that we pray in church? Do we humble ourselves before God? What should I pray for? There's a lot that we could talk about with that. I remember growing up, one of the things that we had to do at the very beginning of December was write our letter to Santa Claus. And what did we put on that list? All the things we wanted. Did you guys do that? I, I was actually looking up for some pretty neat letters to write uh, to read up here, but they all said the same thing. I want, I want, I want. But it actually shows images back in the 1920s where the school children would line up at this mailbox and all drop in their letters. These are the things I want, Santa. Make sure I get them. But I remember regularly not getting the things that were on my list. Because I'll guarantee you I did not put socks and underwear on my list. And I got them every year. And those silly pajamas, I got those too, right? But those things that I wanted most were scarcely ever received. But you know what? December 1st of next year, what did I do? I brought in my new list. Until the point where it came, why bother? If I'm not getting what I want, why should I continue to pray? But here's some things to pray for. Are you sick? Pray. Are you afraid? Pray. Are you lonely? In despair? Depressed? Pray. Is your family in distress in need? Pray. Is your neighbor in need? 
She was a Christian and he was not. And for 25 years, she continuously prayed for him and for his salvation. And one morning, she got up and he said, hey, I want to go to church with you. And he went to church with her. And a month later, he got baptized. And a month later, she passed away. What if, because she did not get what she wanted, she quit praying for him? We are told to continuously pray. Paul says, pray continually. Now, that's kind of hard if you're driving down the road to take that, I got to close my eyes, hold my hands position. But when you do, it's your heart, you pray. And it's really kind of hard when you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. You pray for that that person, but what should you do? Pray. pray. We don't know their situation, right? We need to pray. Uh, no matter how he answers, God will answer. He answers three ways. We've heard this before. He answers yes, and we get overjoyed. He answers no, and we get sorrowful, but we move on. And then there's the dreaded, wait, it's not time yet. I've had to do a lot of waiting in my life. Sarah and Abraham, and throughout the Old Testament, we see lots and lots and lots of waiting. But God tells us to continue to pray. He does answer us. Scriptures tell us he hears every one of our prayers. When he tells us to wait, it might not be a good time for us. But here's what happens as we continue to pray and we continue to draw into the presence of God. We start to be molded into the image of Christ. And the things that we find are important in our lives are not that important. And he molds us into an image that looks like Jesus. And then the desires of Jesus for our lives becomes what we start to pray about. But it takes that humility and surrender to get to that point. So through prayer, we are drawn to the presence of God. We grow in relationship with Him. And our lives become more aligned with His. Praying for others is important. It's not just about submitting our request to God. Because we can do that all day long. But when we are praying for others, we are looking more like Jesus. Jesus on the cross did not pray for his father to remove him from the cross. He submitted himself completely and then prayed for those who were persecuting him and put him on the cross. He prayed for us with his dying breath. We should be praying for those around us, including those we may not like very much, including those in government. As messed up as it may be, we still need to pray for them. We need to be praying for our church and our pastor. He's got a heavy load, especially this time of the year. We need to be praying for each other because prayer is a powerful weapon that God has given us. And it lets us be heard by God and gives God an opportunity to respond in our lives. Pray. As we continue to wait for Jesus, as we ponder the amazing things that God has blessed us with and is continuing to do in our lives, in our church, in our community, and yes, even in our country, Remember to be thankful, including thankful for your difficulties. We may not like them, but those are opportunities for us to grow. I've had a lot of difficulties, and I've grown a lot. And just like a, a, a farmer that is growing grapes, he doesn't just plant the seed and let it grow. He goes out and he prunes, and he tends to the vineyard. It is not comfortable, I'm sure, for that vine to be pinched so that it could grow stronger. But it is healthy for it. And just like us, our difficulties may not be comfortable, but they are used to grow us stronger. 
work in us, through us, for his good and his perfect will. Go to God in prayer with everything. Amen. Now we'll join Mary in a prayer called the Magnificat. Together we'll begin, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things to me, and holy is his name. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. You might have seen the offering plate that's available for our use at the entrance to the sanctuary. We have much reason to be grateful to the Lord in this Advent season and much that he's given to us that we can offer in his service. And that leads us to the prayers of the congregation. What's on your heart that we can lift up this morning, this afternoon? Joellen. Let us pray, Lord, bless those who are around Joellen with senior access, those who give of their time and effort to be of service to others. Continue to keep them faithful in the way that you lead them through Jesus Christ. Betsy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the birth of Obadiah, for a family that rejoices and is excited to get to know this little child of yours. Keep him in your good care. Lead him to a holy baptism and a life eternal connected to Jesus Christ. Suzanne. Let us pray, Lord, we commend Nita to you and ask you to be a strong support for her, an ever-faithful presence for her help and for her life on earth. Sustain her in your grace and support those around her who give their care. And we give thanks to you for this new life being created in Jenna and ask you to watch over her and her husband and family that Together they can enjoy this path that they're on and prepare for the birth of a baby through Jesus Christ. Ruth. Let us pray. Lord, watch over Glenn as he gets moved into rehab. Make that a good thing for him, a benefit that you provide so that his health can return and according to your will he can make a good recovery to daily life among us through Jesus Christ. Twyla. Yes, uh, Sandy's former husband, husband Richard Mazak, he was a pastor. He's in hospice care now. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to sustain Richard in these last days of his life on earth, to watch over him, to guard him, to keep him in faith, to provide for his needs, and to get him ready for his meeting with you and to be drawn in to the nearer presence of his Savior through Jesus Christ. Terry. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you to keep Pastor Marty and Leona in your good care, to give them healing, relief, and a strength for another day. And we ask that too for all those who are affected by the virus, praying your divine intervention and your healing for people and for our country through Jesus Christ. Now we'll stand and continue with the Lord's Prayer and we want to use the words that are on the screen and in the bulletin because this is the, the updated translation that we'll attend to. Together we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the undeserved favor of our Lord Jesus Christ, the loving kindness of God our Father, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.